So who is from the UE? today about vignette data, um, and particularly about using vignettes as a type of standalone uh, qualitative method, and we use this term standalone, and I'll talk about what we mean by that in a minute. So in terms of a kind of overview of what we're going to do, yeah, so we're, this is going to be a kind of tale of two halves. I'm going to do an introduction and do some of a general kind of overview of some of the issues that relate to the use of standalone vignettes in qualitative research, and then Helen is going to talk about some of our data I should say some of our data, but the data that also comes from Bronwyn Royale, who was one of the third year undergraduate students, and so this data forms part of her project. So she will be talking about that data, which is the case study that we use for our chapter in the book, which was about vignettes. Okay. Okay, so when we talk about vignettes in qualitative research, I think it's probably safe to say that vignettes as a research tool are not in any way novel. I think that vignettes are widely used across both social and health science research and have been used since at least the 1950s. So there's lots of different examples of vignette research that you can find out there in the world. Um, in when you kind of look at this field, what you'll probably see is that by and large, most of the work that's been done is quantitative. So 95% of the work that's done in the field of vignettes uses vignettes, in particular these standalone vignettes, as a kind of quantitative method. So the idea is that you're presented with a vignette, you answer a series of questions about that vignette, and those questions are scored in some way and to give you some kind of measure of something. So there, that's a kind of overall example of what a vignette would look like. In qualitative research, they have traditionally been used quite differently. I say traditionally, although there's a very, very small body of work that has spoken about the use of vignettes that is not, I think, reflective of the use of vignettes across the field. I think lots of people do use vignettes. They don't just necessarily talk about them or write about them in their research. Um, but typically they're used to complement other data collection methods. So quite often people will use vignettes as a warm-up exercise, and so in order to get participants to talk about, to talk to each other. Um, they can also be used quite successfully as an elicitation method, and so I've used this in lots of studies that are interview-based studies or focus group-based studies, where the idea at some point in the interview is that you present your participants with a hypothetical story, and at that point, the idea is to try and get them to focus on some elements of the story and to generate or to elicit talk about a particular thing. And so we've done this using news stories and also using geographic data with young people. Um, and there's lots of different, again, lots of different examples of this. Um, one of the other ways in which it's been used is to try to explore an issue in more detail or in a different way. And again, this is the kind of complementary type approach. What we're going to talk about today is using vignettes as a kind of standalone method. And there isn't, as far as I could find, anything out there about the way in which vignettes could be used in this way in more qualitative terms. So I've used this term standalone method a lot now, um, and this is what we mean. So this is an example of a vignette. A vignette is a hypothetical story, and this is the most traditional form of a vignette, is a hypothetical story. Um, and in a standalone vignette, what you do is you have a written, hypothetical, or fictional story that's presented to participants with a series of open-ended questions that come after it that you ask participants to complete for you. And so this is, this is the vignette that was used in the study that Helen is going to talk about. Um, it is um, a vignette about two different, it has two different versions, one of which is a Harry vignette and the other of which is a Hannah vignette. Um, and it talks about Hannah or Harry, who were 15 years old and studying for their GCSEs. Um, it talks about how for the last few months they've become preoccupied with their body weight, lowered their daily food intake dramatically, begun to avoid meals, eaten very little, started a strict um, fitness regime, attending the gym, swimming. Um, Hannah and Harry's recent eating habits and intense exercise program have resulted in extreme weight loss. The family got involved and took them to the doctor. And after consultation, they were then diagnosed with eating disorder anorexia nervosa. So that's a kind of hypothetical story. And then after that, we had a series of questions that we asked participants to answer. Things like, well, we didn't ask, Bronwyn, I should keep saying, Bronwyn asked people to answer, which were things like, why do you think Hannah or Harry has become preoccupied with their body weight? And how do you think Hannah or Harry is feeling at this moment? So that's just two examples of the kinds of questions that you might ask. I think that vignettes, and probably where you've kind of got to thinking about all the different presentations that you've already seen today. Vignettes, this kind of standalone vignette work, sits in a very interesting place 
um, somewhere in between qualitative surveys and story completion tasks. So like story completion tasks, it is a storied type of data collection in that you are presenting your participants with some kind of narrative account or some kind of narrative story that you want them to focus on. However, you then follow that with a series of open-ended questions that actually are quite a lot like a survey. So in that sense, you, you have something that sits between, I would say somewhere, sits between, somewhere between a story completion task and a qualitative survey. And so lots of the kinds of things that you've heard this morning about both story completion and about surveys will obviously have relevance for this, and I'm not going to go back over all of that ground kind of again. So I'm just going to concentrate on the things that I think are most unique about this method. I think whilst that is the kind of, I guess, overall most traditional version of a vignette, I think that it's certainly not the only version. And one of the reasons why I started using vignettes in my own research is because of the fact that they are incredibly diverse. So vignettes cannot, can allow you to do lots of different things in relation to your data. So they can be visual or audio, or they can include elements of both the visual and the audio quite well. And there's some really lovely examples of people who have done this. Like surveys, they can be done online and offline. I have the tendency to do most of it online, but there are, obviously, you can present, as you would with a survey, the vignette and a series of questions to participants in an offline way. They can consist of real life stories, and again, there's some really good examples of people who've used that. Um, they can be news stories, so in our study, where we were looking at political attitudes, attitudes towards immigration, we presented people with two vignettes, um, and those vignettes were written as news stories, because news stories were seen to be kind of appropriate types of hypothetical stories in that particular context. Likewise, they can be geographic data. So we did, a, in the focus groups that we did with our young people, we presented them with kind of hypothetical um, mapped data that pre presented a kind of story about a place because what we wanted to access were the ways in which participants thought about the places that they lived in. But they can also be public health campaigns, art, literature. So there are lots of different ways in which you can present these. They can be staged, um, by which I mean that you can present your... Um, your vignette can be presented in different stages that develop a story. So you can start out by presenting one issue, getting participants to answer a series of questions, and then you can present another part of the story and gauge their reaction to that. So you can present it in a number of stages, or you can present them simply as a complete story. They can also be in the first or the third person. You can direct participants to answer from the perspective of the character or from their own personal perspective, depending on whether you're interested in personal experience with a more kind of hypothetical data. And you can also direct them to think about the difference between should and would, both types of questions. So are you more interested in the pragmatic parts, so kind of would type questions, or are you more interested in idealistic kinds of answers? So what should people do, or as opposed to what would people do? And so there are lots of different elements that you can incorporate into your story to tap into some very different parts of whatever kind of social phenomenon it is that you're interested in the world. I think because of this kind of broad diversity, there's a real <coughs> wide range of different kinds of research questions and theoretical approaches that you can use with vignette data. Um, and so these are some of the examples of studies that have been done using vignettes. So Barter and Reynolds did a study looking at violence between children in residential care homes. Um, Hughes, who did the kind of more classic work in this area, looking at drug injected perceptions of HIV risk and safer behaviour. Um, Odell et al. did some work around young carers. And then there's also been some work around perceptions of receiving and providing healthcare. So there's lots of different examples. Across this different data, people have taken a number of different theoretical approaches. So some of this is phenomenological, so people who are interested in the kind of experience, in, in more kind of experiential type data. Um, Odell and his colleagues took a really interesting dialogical approach. So they were kind of, they were interested in what they call multi-voicedness. So they wanted to see how people took on the voices of different characters and then how that worked out in terms of the data, in terms of how people played identities across the data. Um, and we've used, and I'm gonna let Helen talk about that, we've used, in our data, we use social constructionist approach. So I will let Helen talk about that. But again, it can be very useful as um, Jenny has already spoken about, and Vic in relation to story completion data, it can be really useful for accessing kind of social constructions about particular social phenomena. Okay. <coughs> 
So in terms of why use vignettes, this isn't obviously a, a kind of overview of why everyone should use vignettes, but these are some of the reasons why we think vignettes are useful. Um, they provide insight into participants' meanings and interpretations, but that those meanings and interpretations are always grounded um, in a particular or given context or situation. And so in this sense, there is a balance in vignettes, and this is both a good and a bad thing, between freedom and focus. So they provide, vignettes provide a real sense of focus for a research, um, for, for research into a given social phenomenon. So because you as the researcher write the vignette, what you do is you provide the focus for your participants. And this can be really useful if the thing that you're interested in is very complex and what you want to do is direct attention to a very particular thing. Okay, so they can be very good for focus. However, related to that, there is a kind of sense of freedom in that participants get to answer it using their own words, in their own language. So the kind of open-ended nature of questioning provides a kind of freedom, I guess, in the sense that participants provide you with the answers to the vignette questions that you give them. So there is this kind of tension, if you like, in this data between freedom and focus, and I think that that's kind of one of its interesting characteristics. I think it can be good, and Bendelow talks about this in his work, and he talks about how it provides um, access to spontaneously generated <coughs> meanings and assumptions about some topic. I'm not sure I would agree with the word spontaneous, so there's not that, it's not necessarily always spontaneous, in the sense that you've provided the context, so you've provided the vignettes, you've provided the questions. Um, however, it is, I think, very good at accessing these kind of generated meanings, assumptions about a given thing. And part of the reason why is because of the hypothetical nature of it. So because the story, in a way, is, is because the story is presented in a hypothetical way, it means that participants like the story completion tasks. In a way, I guess it gives them permission to think about the story in a different way. It provides a sense of distance between the participant and the vignette, which can be useful if that's what you want. I think vignettes can be useful for exploring more sensitive topics as well. And this is something that's um, talked about a lot in the vignette literature. Um, and it's one of the reasons why Barton and Reynolds used it in their study, which was about violence between, well, which was children talking about violence in residential care homes. And one of the reasons why it seems to be good, about, good to explore these more sensitive issues is partly because of that sense of distance that I talked about. So vignettes are hypothetical. You can provide even more distance if the vignette is written in the third person, and even more distance, again, if you ask people to write it from the perspective of the character. So you can ask people to do some quite, to answer some quite sensitive questions, but you can provide, we can build in lots of different degrees of distance to that. It can also mean that participants themselves can control when and if they provide, they start to draw on their own experiences. So you don't have to, you can ask participants to draw on their own experiences in their answer, but you don't have to. And participants can choose and can have the control about when or if they choose to do that. So for that reason, it's often seen as being a good way of exploring more sensitive, uh, more sensitive topics. Again, like story completion tasks, it is quite useful if what you want to do is comparisons. So uh, the vignette that, we're gonna, that we used in the study that we're going to talk about in a minute had both a Harry and a Hannah version. So Again, gender is the most obvious thing to manipulate, and so you can have two different versions of a vignette, one of which was male and one of which was female, and you can then gauge participants' responses to those different versions. However, you can also, if you want to, you can also look at differences between participants, so male and female participants. You can randomly assign people to different groups, or you can actually change just about any element of your vignette, as long as the comparison of the vignette that you're, um, that you're that you're using in this study, I guess, as long as the vignette still makes sense. And I'll talk about that in just a minute in terms of the design of the vignette. But often this kind of comparison or this comparative element is something that people like in terms of why they would use vignette study. It has a number of practical advantages in terms of time and money and the speed of the data collection. Um, I think in terms of time, we for the study that we did, we got 57 participants in about a month. So you can get a reasonable amount of data um, in a relatively short amount of time. And once the vignette study is out there in the world, then all you're doing is waiting for the data to come back in. So in that sense, there are kind of savings in time. 
There can be savings in money, depending on how you decide to collect your data. Um, and the speed of data collection can be faster than that. It doesn't have to take you a month. So we, for some bizarre reason, a few years ago, I got into my head the idea that I would put a vignette study onto Amazon's Mechanical Turk, and in two hours, we had over 600 responses. So you can collect an astonishing amount of data in a very short amount of time, but again, it depends what you want to do. So again, as with the other people that have spoken today, it really depends on the kind of data that you want to collect. But it can have these practical advantages if that's one thing that you're interested in, if that's something that you want. <coughs> Okay, in terms of thinking about some design issues, um, obviously a vignette study is like a qualitative survey. So once you give it out to your participants, it's gone. So it's out there in the world, it's collecting data, you don't have time to come back and to re-look at your vignette, it just, it goes. And then your participants fill it in and then that's the data that you get. Um, the central design concern of any vignette study is the design of the vignette itself. Um, and so the idea around the vignette is to make something which is meaningful, authentic and understandable to participants. And as with qualitative surveys, the only way to do that is to pilot. So you have to really pilot and be prepared for the fact that what you want to know is whether or not your vignette makes sense to the people that you're going to be presenting it to. I think that if something, there's not very much that can go wrong with the vignette study, but if something does go wrong, it tends to be in the design of the vignette itself. So the vignette doesn't make sense to people, people don't see it as authentic, they don't see it as meaningful, and so what you get are kind of limited or nonsensical answers out of the data. So that's quite often one of the, one of the major problems that happen in a vignette study. I think a, a kind of good example of that, there is often you'll see vignette studies where the age of, they talk about how you should match your vignette to your participant pool. So if, for example, you present your vignette to a group of students and the scenario in the vignette and seeing these, the, vignette, the scenario in the vignette is actually of somebody much older, quite often that doesn't match. So people don't know how to answer the questions, it's not something that's meaningful to them, it's not something that seems authentic. And so in that sense that data collection can often not work very well. Obviously when we talk about the fact that diversity in terms of vignettes is a good thing, and I think that it is a good thing because it means that you can be really creative and really fun with the way that you design your research, with the kinds of things that you put in your vignette, but it does also require you to make a number of decisions, which some people don't like. Um, so you have to make decisions about whether you want single or incremental stories, about whether you want to make comparisons in your data, or you want to make comparisons between your participants, whether you want to ask should or would questions or both, whether time frame is important to you, so is it important when your vignette is set, um, and what kind of mode of data collection are you going to have online or offline data? So these are all kinds of decisions that you have to think through. And like with the survey, these are decisions that you have to think through before you even get there. So these are things that, so the design phase of a vignette study, or this kind of standalone vignette study, is where all of the time is. So you have to think through all of these different kinds of issues as you work through it. In terms of sampling, what you are doing, as with some of the other um, data collection methods that we've spoken about, you are trading breadth for depth. And I think that, that that is not to say that you cannot get in-depth data in a, in a vignette study. You can get some really lovely um, in-depth, complex and rich data. But by and large, what you are doing is in some way trading depth for breadth. And for the kinds of work that I've done using vignettes, that's entirely appropriate because what I've been trying to look at are kind of much more widely accessible, available meanings, interpretations, assumptions, constructions about some events. So the idea is to go out and to find out something about these in a kind of more breadth way. But because of this, I would say that you need more participants than you would in a traditional interview study, and more participants again if you want to make comparisons. So if you think about the fact that if you wanted to compare two groups of people, you couldn't, I would say that if you had five people in each of those groups that wouldn't give you enough data, you're kind of having to up the ante. So you're thinking about getting 50 people in each of your groups. So the more comparisons you make, the more groups of people you have to have. And so that's just something to kind of consider. And so I would say that whilst comparisons are useful, having done a few of these kinds of vignette studies with comparisons, they're only useful if they're meaningful. So <coughs> if you don't need to do them, then I would say, if you don't, if you don't think you're going to use the data in that way, 
then I wouldn't, because it can open up quite a lot of problems as well. Okay, so that's enough about an overview. I'm going to just hand over to Helen. And uh, I'm going to illustrate some of what Victoria has said with um, our study, which is a study that Bronwyn Royale did as a um, third year project. And as Deborah's already said, it was look, this project was looking at um, constructions, the way in which um, people generally understood <coughs> teenage boys and teenage girls. So, um, thank you. So, we're, we're taking a construction, or we're taking a constructionist perspective in this to look at the ways in which um, anorexia is gendered and to look at the way in which um, boys and girls with, who've been diagnosed with or are experiencing eating disordered problems are understood. And I think a vignette study is particularly useful here for a number of reasons. Anorexia is such a um, prominently gendered, feminized um, issue that it would be um, difficult to get people to... Um, who have ex who are uh, ma male um, teenagers who have experienced eating disorders to um, participate in a survey very obviously but it'd also probably be difficult to get people to um, to participate in a study who had any direct experience or understanding of boys with an eating disorder it's in some ways a kind of non sequitur what do you mean a boy with an eating disorder um, so it's in some ways quite a difficult study um, difficult topic to look at um, you could of course look at media representations or something like that of, of boys with eating disorders but again that's going to be very very limited set of data the vignette um, methodology enabled us Bromwin to ex Explore the gendered nature of eating disorders, the gendered nature, nature of the, the construction of eating disorders in a particular way. Obviously, there's been a lot of critical feminist work around the ways in which anorexic experiences and practices, representations generally of eating disorders are feminized in various ways, but much, much less, if any at all, into, the, into um, male experiences of eating disorders and anorexia in particular. The vignette study, um, the vignette design, as, as Deborah's already said, allows you to, to look at different versions of the vignette. So we had a vignette comparing, as she said, Hannah with Harry. And that enabled us to, to contrast the ways in which people imagine a teenage girl and a teenage boy with anorexia quite, um, quite easily in some ways. The vignette... Um, allowed us to focus on teenagers as a very obvious kind of um, age group to look at given that that's where those kinds of issues tend to emerge to start with. So we could describe a teenager um, but given just their age and the fact that like any child in the UK they're studying for their GCSEs at this point starts to kind of flesh out an idea of a character without actually um, Giving, filling in too much detail, really. Some details about, um, about their kind of, if you like, their eating disorder related symptoms. And we thought an awful lot about what to include and not to include here. As Deborah said, the vignette design itself of the, the scenario is really important to get right and work on. Um, and, and in some ways, I think the, the hardest part, or one of the hardest parts of doing a vignette study. So we thought really hard about not wanting to um, reify the idea that eating disorders were a clinical disorder. Um, so we didn't want to say they, ju they have anorexia, for example. We were quite careful to avoid doing that. Um, we also wanted to sketch out the kind of things, the kinds of practices um, that we wanted somebody um, to be thinking about in describing a teenage 
girl or boy with eating disorders. So we spent quite a lot of time trying to give enough detail to sketch out what might be a serious problem um, for, a, for a teenage child, but without giving um, too much information um, and too much pathologizing information. So very particularly, we decided to introduce a doctor's consultation where the doctor um, diagnoses the anorexia rather than us saying this is a fact. Interestingly, in the, um, perhaps, perhaps it's, it's not so surprising, but in the responses that people gave, there wasn't really any questioning of whether the eating disorder was a diagnosable clinical entity. That, that was kind of taken as read. Um, and perhaps we could have kind of thought about opening up that possibility for questioning put the pathologization in a bit more detail. So I suppose without wanting to say that that went wrong, I don't think it went wrong, but it might have been something that we could have thought through and perhaps come up with a better solution to. Um, but nevertheless, I think hopefully this, this vignette illustrates the way in which we kind of got quite a clear focus, but without... Um, without filling in too much detail, because that's what we want the participants to do, to imagine what Hannah is like and what Harry is like. The other thing that we um, wanted to do with designing this vignette is to design something where we just put Hannah or Harry, we, don't, we haven't changed any other details other than Harry, Hannah, his, her, um, so that we can be quite sure that the diff any differences in responses are, are around that rather than something we've altered it for netball rather than football, for example. So, we're looking at um, those, those constructions, um, the, the, the responses, wanting to get the responses um, to questions from that vignette. We chose to deliver the vignette and the scenario and questions through um, an on online tool, through Qualtrics. Um, so obviously, as people have said already, an easy, a fairly easy form of distribution. And we chose, as you've already seen, to, to deliver that as a single vignette rather than an incremental vignette where we might, uh, we might give a bit of a story, have some questions, a bit more of a story, and so forth. And we did that um, with the idea of having a design that's as simple as possible. We are contrasting two vignettes already. We wanted to have then a, a fairly simple design um, for students to complete. Um, and as Deborah's already said, we got 57 participants very quickly, it being a student um, project. Is primarily young white heterosexual um, undergraduate students, undergraduate women students. Um, one of the things that I think, again, vignettes have a strength for is potentially allowing for different kind of levels of knowledge and experience around a topic. We didn't know um, how much people might know or imagine they knew about um, particularly boys with anorexia. Um, experiencing anorexic problems, which was why we chose not to, to go for a qualitative survey. If we asked people their views about teenage boys with anorexia, would the response be, well, I wouldn't know, surely there are none, etc. Um, so we went for um, a vignette design for that reason, but we equally, we, we, um, we were surprised by the level of experience of eating disorders, not around, uh, around boys, but of um, the participants themselves. So that 30% knew somebody with, who had experienced an eating disorder, and 32% of our, uh, sorry, not 32%, 32 of our participants actually had ex identified themselves as having eating disorder type experiences themselves. So the vignette study, where we're asking about a hypothetical character, allowed for that, obviously, that, that level of experience, but allowed for, um, for having a participant, set of participants who, who didn't have that, that level of experience that we weren't sure about. I'm going to speed up enormously here. Um, and the, the other issue that I wanted to, to flag up here is the design of the questions. 
Um, we chose 10 questions, um, and as I said, a, a, it was a single complete vignette to start with. We did get a bit of a tail off towards the, um, the end of the, 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 the vignette questions, perhaps partly because we had mainly students who were doing the, the study for credits, um, but pe we perhaps could again have thought about um, designing that study differently with... Um, with either less questions or, or an incremental um, presentation. One of the things I think um, we did um, quite well here, though, is the wording of the questions that um, avoid participants thinking that this is some kind of comprehension test or a test of what they know. This is asking people to imagine what Hannah felt, um, what, what they imagine happened next and so forth, what they imagine she's feeling or what Harry's feeling. There isn't a way in which you can't, that it's not asking you to know anything, it's asking you to imagine what she's feeling. And in that sense, it's tapping into cultural ideas about girls and boys who might experience anorexia or anorexic type problems. It's also asking people about um, teenagers experiencing eating disorder problems without asking directly, what do you think of boys who have anorexia or who are diagnosed as anorexic or whatever? It's asking, of course it's asking about that issue, but it's asking in a kind of tangential way that allows people to describe how they imagine Harry to be um, and therefore avoids that kind of social desirability. I'm not going to say I think something pejorative around boys who experience eating disorders, for example. That said, people wrote fairly pejorative things sometimes about Harry and Hannah, so in some ways we could say that it kind of worked quite well in that. I'm going to skip over talking about the analysis as I think we're out of time, but just to illustrate some of the kinds of responses that we've got that um, across different questions that speak to the issue of the ways in which teenagers with eating disorders are gendered in um, the cultural imagination. And I'll wrap up briefly there.